In today's episode of Terrifying True 911 Calls, a woman loses her life after an emergency operator fails to take her seriously. A man calls 911 after killing his brother and five children, and a missing socialite brings a case of twists and turns. Let's get into it, shall we? On November 28, 2010, Penelope Pratt called the Australian Emergency Line, begging the dispatcher to send the police to her hideout. While making the call, she hid in the bushes, away from the intruders. It was not the first time she had called for help that evening. Hello, where do you need police? Yep. Just bear with me a moment, please. There's two people that you want. Okay, just bear with me a moment. I'm trying to find the location. Could that be? Yeah, that's supposed to. What's the problem? Me, that's supposed to give me money, I was there. And I was okay, hang on, slow down. What do you need police for? They just got pigments from me in the hospital. Who's they? they? Me around. Who are we talking I'm, about? I'm, I'm within the vicinity of being hurt. Do you understand what that means? Okay, well, if I can't hear you. If I can't hear you, how am I meant to help you? Trust me. You want to get to this address. Okay, and you need to tell me what we're going to the address for. They wanted people. Um, Who are the people? James Potter or Mendez or whatever his name is. Sorry, what's um, his name, James what? Potter or Mendez. I don't know if he's going to get me back. He may not. Care. Okay, well, you need to tell me what you want me to send police there for, please. Because he's wanted. For what? Dangerous. There's warrants out for his arrest. Are you for real? For what? Are you for I'm not a real? police member. I don't know. Stop yelling don't at me. Know. Then how do you know that there's warrants? Oh my god. Okay, well I'm just trying to do my job. Please, please. Okay, if you want to speak to them, you'll have to call them directly. Do you want me to send police or not? Yes. Okay, then you need to answer my question. I'm hiding in a bush answering your question. Why are you hiding in a bush? Oh my god. Oh my god. Why are you hiding in a bush? Oh my god. Oh my god, what? I'm police violent offended. What are you hiding in a bush for? Because I'm ringing the police. I'm three violent offended. How do you know these three violent people? Through a friend of mine that's not really a friend, a capable old lady. What is your name, please? Penny Pratt. What is your name, please? I'm Paul Taker, number two. What is your contact telephone number, please? What? Paul Taker, number two. So why are these three people violent? What have they oh done? Oh, my God. Can you stop saying, oh, my God, Penny? My okay, well, it is my business if you want me to send police, but you can either ask questions or you don't. She's hitting it. 27-year-old Pratt had been hiding from two men in a small Baronia suburb in Australia for quite a while before her luck ran out. According to further investigation, the men were after her due to an alleged drug debt to the tune of about $160. They were later identified as John Potter and Aaron Gibson. The victim had a troubled childhood. She battled with learning disabilities, and once she started high school, she began experimenting with hardcore drugs like heroin. As an adult, Pratt had two young children who she did not have custody of when she was murdered. After her father died in 2009, she was left over 100,000 Australian dollars, but instead of using it to catapult a new life, Pratt spent the money irresponsibly and it was eventually wasted away. A year later, her partner overdosed on drugs and died, which led her to spending time with James Potter and Aaron Gibson, drug addicts who often took amphetamines. In November of that same year, she called triple zero and was placed in the psychiatric ward and could leave whenever she was ready. Potter and Gibson went looking for Pratt, and when they couldn't find her at home, they were told she was at the hospital. It was almost 11 p.m. and the men went to see her, but the receptionist would not let them in. This made Potter furious. He began swearing and was forceful with a security guard called to calm him down. He then lied to the guard and said Pratt was his sister and had clothes for her. Security then called Pratt and put her on the phone with Potter. She made the fatal mistake of leaving the hospital with the men when Potter told her he had some money to give her. The trio drove to Potter's girlfriend's house in Baronia, but the 27-year-old quickly left. Shortly after, Triple Zero received a call from Pratt in which she told the operator she had been picked up from the hospital by people drunk driving and said she wanted to go back as she would cop a beating. The dispatcher tried to find her location, but the caller repeatedly said she just wanted her money before eventually hanging up on the operator. Ten minutes later, Pratt called again, the final call they would receive from her. 
In a bid to save herself from imminent danger, Pratt had been trying to describe her location to the emergency operator. However, she couldn't as the dispatcher ended the call while she was still talking, which ultimately led to her brutal death. It's alleged that she began fighting with Gibson outside not long after and Krellekamp instructed them to take it indoors. The feud continued with Pratt demanding her money. At some point, Gibson violently grabbed the victim's hair, pointed a 22 caliber sawn-off rifle at her face, and shot her in the jaw. She began pleading for her life, and Gibson put her in a chair and shot her in the left side of her head. Potter helped Gibson drag her to a bath, and he took the gun and shot her in the right eye. The coroner's report said Gibson told Potter to finish the job. He got a large kitchen knife, stabbed her in the heart several times, and cut her throat. The gruesome murder continued until she was wrapped in a living room rug and placed in a car boot that belonged to Krillicamp, the man who saw Pratt trying to flee the house earlier that night. Pratt's body was found three weeks after the murder in the Dandenong Ranges National Park, Olinda. The police were only able to get to the bottom of the case after an alleged accomplice, 48-year-old Adrian Krellicamp, wrote and handed over a 15-page statement to the authorities implicating the other accomplices. Krellekem stated that although he didn't have a hand in the murder, he had helped the killers, 24-year-old Potter and 31-year-old Gibson, hide Pratt's body in his car. Together, the three drove to a bushland where they dumped the body. Krellekem was later charged with being an accomplice to murder and possessing amphetamines and cannabis. He was, however, released on bail after the role he played in bringing the killers to book was duly considered. Adrian Karelic Hamp ran from cameras as he was released on bail. Earlier, police telling the Melbourne Magistrates Court he'd helped dispose of Penelope Pratt's body in the Dandenong Ranges. It's alleged he witnessed the shooting on November 28th, then tried to remove any evidence of the killing from... Potter and Gibson, on the other hand, were charged with the murder. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, Potter and Gibson were sentenced to 24 and 22 years in prison, respectively. Today, 31-year-old Aaron Anthony Gibson faced court charge with murder and was remanded in custody. A third man, 24-year-old James Potter, was arrested today and also charged with murder. It seemed like justice was served since Pratt's murderers were eventually caught and sent to prison. However, outside the courthouse, the victim's aunt, Susan Clear, said she wished the killers had been given the death penalty instead since they had also taken her niece's life. Twenty-seven-year-old mother Brittany Anderson placed a gripping 911 call to the Muskogee County Emergency Medical Service on February 2, 2021. The woman was desperate for help after being shot and was panicked about her children's safety. The accused, Jaron Dejon Pridgen, allegedly initiated the call. 911, please hang up. Hey, I need ambulance. Yeah. Don't hang up. Ambulance is the telephone number you're calling from. Uh, I don't know it. Um, on my phone, I see. Does that sound familiar? Hold on one sec. Okay. Hello. This is the ambulance service. What's the telephone number? I am ambulance. Okay. What's the address where you need the ambulance? Okay. I've got help coming. Just repeat that address to make sure I have it right, okay? Okay, you said nine. Yes. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Um, uh, yes, I, I'm in the consciousness right now. Okay. Well, I've got a lot of help coming to you, okay? You're going to hear silence for just a second while I get everyone started, but don't hang up. I'll be here. Okay. Okay, ma'am, are you alone? Hello? No. Are you alone? No. I have a son. Who has? My kid. I'm dying. I'm still here with you, okay? How many people are how many people are hurt? 
Oh, no. You don't know? Okay. Help is already on the way, okay? I'm dying. Please. Yes, ma'am. They're already on their way. The questions won't slow them down at all. Bear with me. Okay, well. When, when did this happen? No. Is the assailant here still nearby? Can you hear me? Is the attacker still nearby? Yes. Okay. Is there any serious bleeding? I don't know. Okay, that's all right. Again, they're coming as fast as they can, okay? I'm hurting. Okay, they're coming I as fast know. as they can. I hear. All right. I hear I'm one baby. All right, well, I'm going to stay on the I'm line here. with you. I see you, okay. my baby. Well, okay. I don't hear my other kids. You don't hear your other I've kids? I've How many kids were there? I have eight kids. You said eight? Yes. All right. Um, who, what's the name of the person that did this to you? I can't say. You don't know his name? I can't say. I don't know his name either. Okay. Well, they're coming as fast as they can, okay? Okay. I'm still here with you, okay? Mm-hmm. Is, that, is the person still there with you? Ma'am, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. I've got a lot of help coming to you guys, okay? Are you, you still with me? I'm here. Okay, they're coming as fast as they can, okay? And I'm still here. Oh. <laughs> I promise they're coming as fast as they can. I'm still here with you. Just let me know when there's someone there. What's her name? Hope. What's your mom's name? Hope. Okay. And then what is your name? Remy. You said Remy? Brittany. Brittany, okay. Brittany, what's your last name? Anderson. Anderson, okay. Can you tell me your birthday? Okay, ma'am, I'm going to let you go now. The officers are going to take care of you, okay? No way. They're, they're getting ready to call you on the phone. Okay. And, okay, and they're going to call from a private or a blocked number, so make sure you answer, okay? Mm-hmm. I'll let you go so they can call you. Pridgen had first called the dispatcher before passing the phone to Brittany. His voice was continually heard loudly in the background of the call, which revealed that Brittany's attacker was present for its duration. However, when the dispatcher asked for the attacker's identity, the woman refused to give it out, possibly fearing what Pridgen would do if she outed him. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that Pridgen was no stranger to Anderson and that some of the deceased kids were actually his. When authorities responded, the killer exited the house but attempted to flee when officers told him to drop his weapon. After a short pursuit, he was arrested and charged with six counts of first-degree murder for nine-year-old Cadence Anderson, six-year-old Nevaeh Pridgen, five-year-old Harmony Anderson, and the shooter's brother. One count of shooting with intent to kill Anderson and one count of possession of firearms after conviction or during probation. Turn around. I can't tell. Drop what's in your right hand slowly. Slowly put it down. He didn't even come in. He's running southbound, he's got a gun! Running southbound, he's got a gun. Southbound, back to the west. Stop fired. Hold up here, hold up here. 
Show us your head! Where's he at, Leach? Where's he at? How much gummy? Fuck. Watch your life. I hit this car. Show me your hands. Contact north side. No. Show us your hands. I think he's right here. He's behind that tree over here. Walk this way with your hands up. Walk this way with your hands up. Which tree? Hands up. Which tree, Greg? The second, the very back one. Walk this way with your Walk hands up. Walk this way with your hands up. Walk backwards. Keep walking. North side of Pleasant Do Valley. Do not lower your hands. Keep them up. Here, y'all want to focus on top. Keep walking backwards with your hands in the air. Do not reach for anything. Keep going. Keep going. We can put them up wherever Keely, come over here. Okay. We're good. We can open here. Who's got? Gilly, you got hands? Keep we, walking backwards. We can prone them out right there. He's out in the open. Drop down to your knees. Fuck, dude. Might be tough. Come on. We're approaching. Greg got hands. Do not move. You know the house? It's a door crack. It's about hard inside. What's your name? Brittany recovered from the injuries inflicted on her. However, a year after the incident, the bereaved woman said she had developed survivor's guilt. Although she has three other children, she believes she should have died in place of the five. The trial has faced numerous delays following missing transcripts, but the DA's office is currently pushing for the death penalty. The paramedics who took the call said that day would be something that would stick with them forever. If you want to support this channel, please like this video. Police in Danville, Ohio received a 911 call where the caller said her ex-boyfriend wanted to kill a cop. Minutes later, Officer Thomas Cottrell was found dead. 911? Yes, I'm in danger. Okay, where are you at? The, the cops in Danville are in danger too. My, uh, my ex-boyfriend's out in TMO looking to kill a cop. He's got my house keys. He's got my truck keys. He's got um, guns on him. He's already beaten me and uh, threatened to kill me. I don't know. He's coming. Hold on. I gotta go. What's his name? Herschel Ray Jones. Do you want me to send a cop to your house? No, that's the bad thing. He'll kill me. The January 17th, 2016 call was placed by the killer's ex-girlfriend. She told dispatchers that Herschel Jones III had come into her house and beaten her up. He then left, taking her house keys, truck keys, and some guns with him, saying he was looking to kill a police officer. Unfortunately, Officer Thomas Cottrell fell prey to Jones. Officer Thomas had been the only officer on duty that night in the small town. According to the Danville police, they tried reaching the officer after receiving the alarming call, but couldn't. It appeared that Jones's ex called 911 at 11.20 p.m. and 11.47 p.m. The murder happened roughly 27 minutes later behind the Danville Municipal Building. Upon examination, it was discovered that Officer Cottrell died from a gunshot wound. At about 1.30 a.m. in the early hours of the following day, Herschel Jones III was seen by the police running from an apartment on E, Washington Street. Immediately, the police began to chase him, and fortunately, they caught him and arrested him. The fallen officer's wife, Tanya Elliott, said their lives would no longer be as perfect because Cottrell wasn't in it anymore. To make things even more devastating, Thomas's daughter spoke of how he would miss the important moments of their lives, such as high school, graduations, enrollment into college, and walking them down the aisle on their wedding days. 
In her statement, Cottrell's mother, Melissa Osborne, wrote, I beg for no mercy to be shown to my son's killer. There was no mercy for my son as he was cowardly ambushed and killed, all because of his uniform. While in court, Jones was asked why he killed the officer. He replied while scoffing and cursing that the officer had a badge. Jones pleaded guilty and was given a sentence of life imprisonment with zero chance of parole. Despite Cottrell's mother's appeal, Jones escaped the death penalty because he willingly pleaded guilty to the murder. Back Herschel Jones spewed a string of swear words at Thomas Cottrell's family members just moments after being sentenced to life behind bars for the 2016 murder of the Danville police officer. On the evening of February 26, 2014, Kathy Carpenter, a bank teller and close friend of well-known Aspen socialite Nancy Pfister, was concerned when Pfister had not returned her phone call from two days earlier. When Carpenter found out that her friend had not shown up for her job for two days, she decided to drive to Pfister's secluded log home in rural Buttermilk, Colorado. The woman made her way around the home, looking for the missing woman. Carpenter noticed the bed in disarray, the comforter draped over the side, and the sheets pulled off one side of the mattress. As she drew closer, she noticed a tiny stain of blood spattered on the bed frame. The walk-in closet was locked, so she went home to get the key. Inside lay Nancy Fister's lifeless body. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. 911, what is the address of the emergency? Help me. Oh my god. Oh. What is the address of the emergency? Oh. Is that a house business or apartment? It's a house. It's Nancy Fister's house. My, my friend. Uh, Ma'am, tell me exactly what happened. Oh, okay. My, my, my friend had it. Oh, I got my friend in the closet. <laughs> Ma'am, tell me exactly what happened. My, my friend came back from Australia, said she could screw it. She had some people living there. She really pissed them off. And um, she made threats to them about owing money. And I don't know. She, I couldn't find her. She didn't call. And these people said the dog had been in the house. And she hasn't been around. So I went up there to get the dog. And was looking for her. I need you to tell me exactly what happened. I, I can't. My friend is in her closet. Yes. In her closet. Yes. Okay, stay on the line with me. We're going to send help that way. Oh, I the small town socialite was the daughter of two well known parents. Her father, Art Fister, made a fortune when he turned his family cattle ranch into the Buttermilk Ski Resort. Her mother, Betty Haas Fister, was a Women Air Force Service Pilots member in World War II. In later years, she flew a helicopter, which she was notoriously known for parking in the family's driveway. When she was younger, Fister met John F. Kennedy, Jack Nicholson, Cher, and Michael Douglas when they vacationed at her parents' ski resort. She was briefly engaged to Michael Douglas. During the murder investigation, police immediately became suspicious when they received information that Fister had returned home early from a vacation a week before her murder. Kathy Carpenter told them that she had picked the woman up from the airport, driven her home, and was asked if she could stay at the house over the weekend by her friend. On Monday morning, Carpenter got up early and left for work, leaving Fister alone at the house. She left a note on the door for guests, saying that Fister was sleeping and to call her to see if she was awake enough to talk before entering the house. Another one of her friends, Billy Clayton, said that he did not want to bother Fister while she was sleeping, so he sent her an email, but she never replied. Leading up to her murder, she rented her house to retire Dr. Trey Styler and his wife Nancy as a way to help pay off her mortgage. Fister abruptly evicted the Stylers from her house and refused to let the Stylers collect their belongings from the home. However, things became even more strange on the Wednesday when the pair called Carpenter to tell her that they had recently moved out to a motel in Basalt, Colorado. The Stylers said they were returning to the home just to clear out their belongings. By this point, nobody, including the roommates, had seen or heard from Fister since Monday morning. 
This would later draw suspicion from the police and Carpenter. At the time, Nancy Styler said the dog had been alone for a while since the dog's food and water dishes were empty. Investigators believe that Fister had been killed on Monday and left in the closet until Carpenter's gruesome discovery. On the flipped side of the mattress where they believed the victim had been murdered, they found a large pool of blood. Based on where her body was placed, detectives also deduced that she had been attacked by two people who carried her body to the closet. Since there was no sign of forced entry, they started focusing on Trey and Nancy Styler. Additionally, they became aware of a monetary dispute between the trio. The Stylers paid Carpenter $6,000 since Fister was on vacation, which she kept in a safe deposit box. They said they would move out by February 22nd and weren't there, but their belongings were. The homeowner grew annoyed with the couple for not moving out fast enough and began locking the house during the day while she was at work. Police questioned the Stylers separately following the murder, and both denied any involvement. In fact, Trey Styler even took a polygraph test. He failed the test, which added to investigators' suspicions, but they didn't have enough to lay charges against the two. Authorities couldn't use DNA since they lived in the house. Police were contacted after a city worker discovered a bloody hammer, pill bottles with Nancy Fister's name printed on them, and a vehicle registration for Trey and Nancy Styler's Jaguar behind the motel where the Stylers were staying. On March 3rd, 2014, they were finally arrested when investigators discovered the owner's key to the closet, essentially the crime scene, outside the Stylers' hotel room. Carpenter was also arrested and charged with first-degree murder three weeks later after investigators thought she had helped the two commit the crime. This was based on multiple statements she made to detectives while describing items she had seen at the crime scene. Those items seemed impossible to have been observed. The autopsy report showed that the wounds to Fister's face were caused by someone beating her with a hammer. Since there were no defensive wounds, it seemed she was beaten while she was asleep. He determined that the cause of her death was due to blunt force trauma to the head and exsanguination. In her interview with the police, Nancy Styler called the victim a liar and an alcoholic, claiming the community hated the woman. She claimed Fister had called her and her husband trailer trash and said they should be living in a trailer park. The accused said the woman treated herself and Carpenter like a slave. Prosecutors used this to say the Stylers and Carpenter had motives to kill Fister. However, on June 12th, Trey Styler confessed to the authorities that the murder was all his idea and that he did it himself. This led to the release of his wife, Nancy Styler, and Kathy Carpenter, who had spent over three months in prison. Nancy's defense attorney, Beth Krulowicz, also said that the court did not have enough evidence to sentence her client. Trey was then sentenced to 20 years in prison on the count of second-degree murder. He, however, did not serve his complete sentence as he was found to have hung himself at the Arrowhead Correctional Center on August 6, 2015, after his wife filed for divorce upon leaving prison. Not satisfied with the ruling over her mother's case, Fister's daughter, Juliana Fister, later filed a lawsuit against Nancy Styler. The details of the lawsuit included that Nancy ripped a book deal and life insurance of $1 million off her mother's and Trey's death. In addition, it was also stated in the lawsuit that Trey could have gotten a false confession because he didn't want his wife to face jail time. Reconsidering the details concerning Fister's death, the victim had been hit on the head with a hammer and plunged in the chest with an axe. An extension cord was found around her neck. After she was confirmed dead, Fister was then wrapped inside a trash bag and locked in the bedroom closet. According to the argument presented by the lawsuit, Trey couldn't have acted alone because it would take more than one person to put a body inside a trash bag. Citing all these injustices, Piper's daughter, Juliana, wanted Nancy to pay for damages. Aspen attorney, David Bovino, explained, I truly don't believe Juliana is financially motivated at all. This is in memory of her mother to hold someone who she believes is responsible for her mother's murder. At the time of this video, it is unclear whether or not Juliana got compensated, but as her attorney said, there is no man of money in the world that will bring back Juliana's mother. Courtney Martinez and her fiancé, Adam, got lost in a snowstorm after opting to take another route to their home. 
Shaken by fright, Courtney then dialed 911 in the hopes of getting someone to rescue them. 911, what is your emergency? I'm walking in the field. I don't know where I am. You're walking in the field. Okay, I need you to just stop, okay? I'm going to try to find you on my screen. Did you go in the ditch? Yes, and then we started walking. We thought we were close to the house. Okay, can you go back to your vehicle? I can't. I don't know where it is. You don't know where it is. Okay. All right. I want you to just stay in line with me. It looks like I can find you while you're out on the prairie. One second. What road were you driving on? We were coming up the show. Okay, one second. Hello? Okay, I'm still online with you, okay? I have that car I got a call for too, Dave. Okay. How many people are with you? Me and one other person. Okay. I want you to just... Which way, do you remember which way you're walking or you totally got no, turned around? I don't know. Okay. What I want you to do is I'm just trying to pull you up on the map right now again to see if I can find a different location of which way that you're actually walking towards if you moved at all. Okay. What I want you to do is, can you, which, you don't know which way, can you, can you start walking? Oh, I don't know. I need you to start walking. You don't know which way west is at all? You don't know no, which way Prairie Road is? I don't. You have to know which... I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I want you to start walking. You're going to have to start walking one way or the other, and at least then I'm going to be able to tell you which way to go, okay? <laughs> do, you, do you have enough clothing on? What? No, I came from a wedding. I'm in... I don't have any. Okay, all right. I'm going to um, page out some people then, obviously, to, to help find you, okay? Okay, and that's what I'm going to do, okay? Okay, I want you to stay in line with me, okay? I'm crying. Okay. Courtney and Adam were natives of Green Lake County in Wisconsin. In December 2010, the two got trapped in a snowstorm after choosing to forsake the highway for a walk across the field which was supposed to lead them home. Frightened and with no idea how to get home, the distraught couple called 911. The sheriff's dispatcher told Courtney and Adam to dig into the snow for shelter. While communicating with them, she was able to find the latitude and longitude of their cell phone, which she then sent to the deputies. After two hours, the deputies used a GPS device to locate the couple, who were then rescued. For more True 911 calls, watch this episode next. You can also let me know which call was your favorite in the comments below.